I just share my slides. Thank you, Sophie. Hello, all. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting my uh, paper from Electronic Imaging 2020, so from earlier this year. Um, in this paper, I lays the foundation to my PhD project, and I'm looking into um, determining the performance of a camera system from natural scenes, so images of natural scenes, rather than test charts. So to begin with, what is camera performance? Very briefly, camera performance is how faithful is the image compared to the scene? And there's a number of ways we can uh, have this comparison. And when I'm talking about camera performance, I'm specifically talking about sharpness and resolution. So every single camera system introduces a certain amount of blur to the image. Um, the question is how much? And the modulation transfer function, the MTF, is the uh, measure which we use to quantify this. So the MTF is a bell-shaped curve such as this, um, so it's a bell-shaped curve, um, the spatial frequency versus modulation. You can think of uh, modul uh, spatial frequency as detail. Um, so as the detail is increasing, the rendition of that detail decreases. So the best way to think of this is if you have a um, sheet of white paper with black text on, up close we can define the letters to the background, but as that a uh, piece of paper goes further and further back. We struggle to read the letters um, and the, the detail, rendition of that detail decreases. This is what is showing here, but for a camera system. The, um, the, the slope of the uh, MTF um, defines the performance of the camera system. So in this, this MTF, the second one, which is showing in green, is a lower performer than the, this one, because this one maintains higher, higher modulation for higher frequencies. Um, to, compare to, uh, to compare MTFs, um, there's certain measures we can take. So MTF 50 is 50% 50, uh, 50 of the modulation, um, at the, the frequency at 50% of the modulation. And, we, and uh, MTF10 is 10% of the modu um, modulation. And this is how we um, quantify um, resolution. So traditionally, um, this measure is done using test charts. Um, I'm specifically looking at the slanted edge method, which uses a perfect step edge input as a test chart. Um, a perfect step edge is uh, one tone, but, uh, and then another tone without any gradient between the two. So it's a step. As the, we photograph the test chart under controlled conditions, controlled lighting, um, and as it, the step edges pass through the camera system, there's, it, blurs the camera, it blurs the step edges. So now there's a um, transition between the two tones. We select those edges either through a manual process or an automatic process and then calculate the MTF. The MTF is the modulation of the transfer, the modulation of the Fourier transform of the line spread function. The line spread function is the first derivative of the profile of the step edge. When we talk, when we're using slanted edge method, um, we take a, we take the profile of the edge throughout the region of interest. Um, and then we, we take a projection down that slope and resample the ESF. So we have a super sampled ESF, which we can then measure the MTF with. Um, there's a number of reasons doing it this way. Um, the, it's simpler to implement with digital camera systems and we get a higher, we can obtain data beyond the Nyquist frequency. So this is where my project comes in. I'm aiming to replace uh, the test chart with images of natural scenes. So we can photograph any scene and determine the performance of the camera system. Um, natural scenes are, there's a number of problems. So natural scenes are photographed under uncontrolled conditions. So the lighting varies, um, the scene content changes. So it depends upon the scene, scene uh, 
If there's edges in the scene, depends on the scene. If those edges may or may not be uh, step edges, and those step edges um, may or not be perfect in imperfect step edge inputs. If we somehow then, uh, from an image of a natural scene, isolate uh, step edges in regions of interest, and then measure the MTFs using the standardized uh, MTF equation, what is it we obtain? Um, well, it's no longer an MTF as such because the input, as I say, is not characterized, is not um, known. Um, so we refer to these MTFs as natural uh, scene derived MTFs, NS MTFs. So before I go any further, wh what's, why, why is this important? Why, is, why, why, do, or why are we suggesting to move away from um, a well-defined standardized test chart method to um, using natural, natural um, scenes? Well, there's a number of uh, reasons and there's a number of um, applications of such a method, one of which is implementing a live performance measure for um, AI applications where computer vision is vital. So for example, CCTV and automated driving. So we can monitor the performance of the input signal um, and also not only the signal of the camera system, it's not only the camera system itself, but the scene. So if it um, suddenly becomes foggy with automated driving, um, a live performance measure can detect this, and um, and this is the kind of applications that such a method can be used for. So, to the framework to um, to sh uh, lay the foundation towards such a goal is as follows. So we have a database of images, all taken with the same camera system, so the same camera lens and aperture. We extract the first image. And then we detect the um, edge locations through an edge detector, specifically the canny edge detector. Um, the canny edge detector um, is simple to implement, so it doesn't only detect the step edge, the, uh, the step edge, which is what we are after, but also other edge profiles. So the first step is to eliminate any edge profile that we don't want to be used and is not appropriate for the slanted edge method. So we take a gradient across each of the regions of interest. And if there's a singular uh, increase or decrease in gradient, then a step edge is present and that region of interest can be used. Um, following this is we, we should, uh, we measure certain parameters that we know cause variation within the slanted edge method. Um, some very basic um, parameters include the edge angle, the edge contrast and the region of interest size. The region of interest size is an interesting one because um, it determines what edges can be extracted from natural scenes. And this is not something that's considered when we're using test charts. So the region of interest width, we want to be as narrow as possible because we can extract more edges out of a natural scene. And also it has the benefit of reducing the effects of noise upon the slanted edge method MTFs. The region of interest height, however, there's a compromise to make. So in ideal conditions, so for a test chart, we want as a uh, long region of interest as possible. Um, meaning that we get a higher um, accuracy in our MTF measure. But when we're extracting regions of interest from natural scenes, the um, length of the edge becomes a disadvantage because there's a more higher likelihood to include unwanted artifacts such as scene textures, noise, uh, um, ununiform lighting, as well as um, there's depth of field to consider. So an edge may go, in, a long edge may go in and out of focus due to depth of field. So when we're solely talking about extracting edges, we want a short region of interest height. However, that comes at a disadvantage of a um, error within the MTF. So our framework is looking into uh, it. Our framework extracts region of interest height of 128 pixels, which is the minimum recommended for the slanted edge method. Um, but we do extract regions of interest smaller than this if that 128 pixels can't be um, obtained. 
the radial distance also is uh, something to consider as it's very well known in the center of an optical system. Um, this the, the, is the highest performance. And as, the, as you move towards the corners of the um, frame, the performance decreases. So where the region of interest is located within the frame determines the performance of in, the, in that specific radial distance. There's a variation in performance. So once all these uh, parameters are measured and saved within the individual um, M, uh, regions of interest, the next step is to measure the NSMTFs. To do this, we use the standardized ISO 12233 uh, mathematical procedure. Um, specifically, I've been using uh, Peter Burns's SFMAP4 to achieve this. This process is then applied to all the images within the database. So we obtain a large quantity of natural scene derived MTFs for this specific um, camera, camera system. Edge isolation was a major part of um, this study as it determined how many edges can be um, extracted and how much data we can achieve. Um, Within a test chart, this is not so much of an issue because all the edges are well spread out um, and easily isolated. Within natural scenes, however, if we have a step edge, it's usually in close proximity to other step edges. We can take smaller regions of interest, but as I've previously mentioned, smaller regions of interest have a higher likelihood of error. It has error within the MTF measure. So if we want this 128 pixel region of interest height, we need to extract the entire edge. So we developed a method to, that's influenced by the filtered tails procedure from Williams and Burns. The fil filtered tails procedure blurs either side of the edge to reduce the effects of noise on the uh, MTF. If, in the, our case, if we just blur either, either side of the edge, all we're doing is blurring other artifacts. So we just blur this unwanted edge. Um, Therefore, um, we adapted this. So we, we take the edge of, in, edge of interest into a edge mask, and this area remains untouched. The, then a T-shaped median, so either side of this mask, a median is taken, and it's used to fill the um, region of interest, isolating the edge of interest. Under high noise levels, we get this streaking artifact. So we've also applied a weighted Gaussian um, in the two cor opposite two corners. Again, the region of the edge of interest remains untouched. So anything in that mask remains untouched. Um, please note also that this example is SNR4, so it's extremely high noise levels. Under normal noise levels from natural scenes, so SNR15 um, and above, this streaking artifact isn't as present, so it's not as much of an issue as it's being shown here. This is just to demonstrate the streaking artifact. In addition to a, um, this pixel stretching allows us to isolate close proximity edges, it also reduces the effects on noise on the MTF in a similar manner to how the uh, filtered, filtered tails procedure works. So we get a, um, better data for higher um, noise levels. To test the, to initially test our framework, we used a test chart um, and gone through the standardized procedure to measure the M MTF um, using the ISO 12233. And this is our ground truth. We then used a data set of 30 images. This is a national database um, and these Images have been chosen specifically because they're in, they have been taken in well-lit conditions and have visual step edges within them. Current research it has expanded on this to 1,500 images of varying scenes and varying uh, lighting conditions. So first of all, um, we just looked at the test chart. So we manually selected all the edges within this test chart and um, put the same test chart through our framework to so just ensure that it's selecting step edges and the pixel stretching isn't causing any major issues. And we can see from here that the, the two results are very similar. So just to go through the color coding here, 
Um, the gray MTFs here are the individual edges from this test chart measured using our framework. And then th then it creates this envelope, MTF envelope. For the MTF envelope has a weighted average here in the middle, 95th and 5th percentile. The green is the manually selected edges from the test chart and the red is from our putting the same test chart through our framework. So again here, the green is the manually selected edges from the test chart and the red this time is from a natural scene, this natural scene. Um, we, can, we observe that the envelope of a natural scene MTF is very dependent upon where the region of interests are coming from. So in this example, a lot of the regions of interest are coming from the corners and part way, but not so much in the center. So we obtain an envelope on the lower region of the expected MTF envelope from a test chart. In addition, uh, I'll, bring your notice to, I'll bring your notice down to the higher frequencies. Rather than the MTFs going down to zero, there's a boost in the higher frequencies. And we can see the 95th percentile um, plateaus off just below 0 0.2 modulation. This is, due, not due, this is not due to the uh, noise within the um, camera system itself because it is a well-lit um, well scene, but it's due to noise due from textures within the scene, so fine brickwork texture, boosting these high frequencies. If we, however, have a scene such as this where we can extract regions of interest from the center, partway and corners evenly distributed throughout the frame, we obtain an envelope that is very similar to the, uh, to the ground truth, to the test chart. If we take an average of all of these um, scenes, so all 30 images, we obtain this red MTF here, which is an estimated system MTF. And if we compare that to the actual system MTF from a test chart shown in green, um, it's a very close uh, estimate. So to conclude, um, the initial results look very promising. Um, through further work, um, this has laid the foundation to um, a live performance measure. Um, and we also observe that MTF envelopes are not only dependent upon the camera system itself, so not only dependent upon the performance of the camera, but also dependent upon the scene content. So ongoing research is taking this further using a larger database, as I have mentioned. Um, we are looking at what do these natural scene derived MTFs tell us? What do they mean? Um, and whether we can faithfully estimate the system MTF from natural scene derived MTFs and have them comparable to the ISO standard and what scene types are best required for this. Thank you for listening. So I'll take some discussions and answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Oliver, I would like to ask you to stop sharing your screen yeah. now so we can all see um, the gallery, have the gallery view and see uh, each other. I would like also to um, ask uh, as many of you uh, as you uh, wish to uh, have your cameras on, so we have a, a, a live discussion um, where we can see each other. Um, and um, I would like to open the discussion uh, with questions from the audience. Uh, and if not, I can, I can start with my own questions. But um, if you want to raise your hand, you can do so, and I can have a, a view, and I can give you the talk, or you can just... Um, start the discussion as you wish. So any direct, immediate questions? So I can start with one myself, Oliver. Um, um, so it's, this is an, a, a very interesting and novel uh, way of looking at MTFs. Uh, it's unconventional in that, uh, obviously, uh, you don't have known conditions, uh, but and, and you are in, 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 the, in the middle of your research. Uh, and one of your aims, obviously, is to, as you said in, in your conclusions, is to have an accurate uh, estimation of the MTF. Um, so at the moment, you show us results from, from 30 since I believe, or so. Uh, and these were manually selected. Uh, so it's not any scene. 
and your results is, are, are, are pretty good, but the, this is a restricted data set and, and, and carefully somehow, uh, if I'm not mistaken, chosen. So do you want to expand a little bit on how you would accurately measure um, the, the, the system and TF, or how do you see this progressing, uh, given uh, a completely random data set, um, and given um, that that you haven't you haven't you have an unknown system and you want to estimate the MTF uh, as close as possible to a ground truth that you would take from the labs from a particular uh, edge target. Sure. So um, the first thing to, we we're doing is to extract edges that are the highest performance. So these so from a natural scene we're obtaining lots of different edges. These right. edges um, are not all perfect step edges. Some of them are um, got a gradient in them in the scene. So by photographing that it's it's a lower performance edge. So the first thing to do is to extract the edges with the highest performance. So this is done through taking um, the 10th percentile of the distribution of um, LSFs. So we get the LSF half peak widths. So we the get line the, spread functions, the half yeah, peak the line spread, the line spread functions. functions, yes. Um, so we obtain um, the highest performing edges and these are the more likely to be um, from perfect step edges. Okay. Um, and then we also, as I've mentioned in the talk, that there's um, angle, contrast, region of interest size, and all of these parameters have an effect upon the and cause variation within the MTF using slanted edge method. So once we obtain the highest performing edges from these natural scenes, we then are looking at the um, all these parameters. So I've created this uh, six-dimensional lookup table with all these different um, parameters, and then from and this, the parameters being the angle and as the you angle, said, the, yeah, contrast, yeah, yeah, the angle contrast, uh, right. region of interest, uh, region right. of interest size, the radial distance, right, um, right. and the frequency. Um, so from this, we can we can estimate the system MTF, so the MTF from a test chart, um, using the standardized. So in, in the standard, there's specific. Um, angle you should use a five degree angle, um, but that can be between five and 25, 30. Um, and this is tested, a, yeah. Yes, and this is tested. Image, yeah. There's yeah. a specific contrast you should be using, there's a specific um, region of interest you should be using. So from this, we um, have this multi dimensional uh, interpolation to, ex to find this specific value, and this is our system. So this is what you. You have been, this is the current uh, research. Yeah. But, but in, in some ways, how, my question was more on how do you know that you're going to find this in, in any scene or do you need a bunch of scenes? So you, sure. can you um, determine the MTF from any scene or do you want a bunch of scenes taken with the same camera and camera sure. settings? I've got a, I've got so a, how do you go I've got a slide that? on this. So if I share my screen again. Sure. So... So the NS MTFs, so natural scene derived MTFs, are a function of both the scene content, so um, all these various different types of edges, and the um, camera system performance. So the holy grail, as it were, is to I, um, split the two. Um, so we have the performance of the camera system and the performance of the uh, scene. So we have this statistic, statistical measurement of the scene and the frequencies within the scene. Um, not all scenes will contain this um, this from this the MTF from the test chart. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's perfect and it's, edges. Yeah. So we, so that's one of the areas we're looking at. We're going to be um, splitting the uh, scene types and looking at what scene types are best used for this method. Um, and through the procedure, as I mentioned, to try to estimate. It's not, it's not going to ever split the, the, the system MTF from the scene content, but it's a good estimation of the scene, the system MTF. So it matches what you would get from... From, from a test chart or... Um, I don't know if SPM. anybody wants to comment on that 
or have more questions related to what we are discussing uh, in particular for the particular scene somehow types. Uh, and if not, I can chip in with a, with, a, with a further question. So I'm looking at the audience and I don't see any hand on for the moment. Okay, Jeff, yes. Um, and then, then, uh, then Joseph from what I saw. I'm sorry, I don't have you all at once. So Yeah, this uh, is uh, Jeff Mulligan from NASA Ames Research Center. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, you have gone to a lot of trouble to restrict the analysis to the edges. And I'm curious what, how much better the results are than if you just sort of computed a radial average uh, power spectrum and you know, assume that you're going to be looking at a lot of non-edge parts that will contribute to the lower frequencies, but that whatever edges are there will will come into the higher frequencies. And um, mm -hmm. ha have you done something like that just as a baseline measure, or um... Um, we haven't for this project? But it's very similar to the approach that uh, my colleague or. Uh, Ed Fry, a, he just passed his PhD, which used a texture method. Um, and that was his approach of using the uh, noise, the noise power spectrum within the uh, um, natural scenes to estimate the um, noise MTF. So that was a, that's a well, different approach. It's a different approach, yeah. Yes, and it, yes, and, it, yes. and it, it, it has uh, just to, to, uh, to give some, provide some more information. Sure. Um, to Jeff, uh, yes, we we um, we use this method to derive MTFs from natural scenes from images, not live MTFs, um, um, which is the ratio of the measured to the to to the original power spectrum, especially essentially, and give a, a one-dimensional MTF through radial averaging. Um, and and without, I can send you the paper, Jeff, but the papers uh, without going into detail. There are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages, obviously, is that the, the, the measure does not rely only on edges, but all, all kind of textures in the scene. So, so uh, but, but you have various biases involved um, that are detailed on the paper. So it's a different technique. Um, and it's not from directly live scenes, because you don't have the original power, scene power spectrum. Uh, but it's from images of natural scenes where they are characterized, the, the input is semi-characterized somehow. Um, but it's a different, as I said, it has different problems. It's a, it's, it's a very good approach, but it's, it has a bias problems. It's still, a, a, you know, it's a great approach. So thank you for the uh, question. And then we, uh, do you want to, to, to add something, Jeff, to, to that, or should we move on? Your, your, yeah. I think you can move on. Thank you. Okay, so I can, you know, we can communicate the papers if you if you are interested. Otherwise, Joseph, your your microphone is off. Joseph, your your, your yeah. Oh, there we go. That's, yeah, there you go. Calibration. Is there any usefulness here of integrating somehow calibration into the system? that helpful? Would it be helpful? Calibration in what, in what respect? Well, uh, the images you're looking at are, are natural, mm -hmm. but uh, is there some way you could throw a, a test chart into the picture? Uh, yes, and um, setting up the framework, we have uh, been doing this um, as an approach to determine if, if the, but the using edges specifically if we have a non-linear ISP, it becomes um, fairly. Uh, it becomes very dependent upon the um, signal processing with the camera system. So it's um, a isolated edge in a, in a test chart is very easy to um, keep sharp whilst applying denoising, for example. But within a um, natural scene, um, we've, when we've applied this to a um, smartphone where there's a huge amount of non-linearity, um, we obtain uh, the, the um, ISP, compression and all this um, affects the MTF very differently. Um, so it's 
this measure is not specific is has that element of the non-linearity as well as um, um, so it's a, it's a combination of the performance of the camera system and the content of the scene um, and how the two react as well for non-linear processing. Again, if I can add to Joseph, um, in some ways, um, throwing a test chart in, in, in uh, a scene, especially when we are talking about cameras specifically, when we're talking about cameras with non-linear ISP, um, such as those incorporated in um, CCTV systems or uh, in automated driving or in camera, uh, uh, mobile, mobile camera phones, um, one of the problems is that the test chart is not a calibration anymore. In some ways, it's not a way of characterizing the system just because of the nonlinear speed. So, so you derive an MTF from, from, from a, a, a good edge on a test chart, and this MTF is not indicative of the, of the performance of the system. And that's why, in essence, taking MTFs from edges when you have nonlinear ISP, it, it's not especially isolated edges as in the test charts are not representative anymore and the noise method or you know the power spectrum method somehow it's a, a better technique um, or looking at edges which are incorporated in scenes is possibly this is what we are looking at it's possibly a, a, an alternative but in a way the calibration the, the test chart is not a way of um, of, of a calibration in a way element within with, within the mix in in our mind just because of the non-linearities. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? I don't see. Uh, I have to go around the room to see if anybody has a physical hand up. Um, um, so. Um, I will throw one more question um, mm -hmm. in, in the mix. Um, so in some ways, um, how are you going to, um, to continue with, with this in classification and how are you going to find out what type of scenes and where your method is usable? Also, if you have an idea of the number of scenes which they, you need um, uh, to, that they can give you a good estimate or, uh, of, of what you expect as, as being the system MTF? Yeah, so um, once we have this uh, estimate of the MTF, the system MTF um, um, grounded and, it's, and for the entire 1,500 images, it produces a result that is reasonable. Which is to, your current data set. Yes, yeah. yes current data set. Yeah. We are then splitting that data set up into um, using various metrics and natural scene statistics and all these different uh, methods to characterize these um, scene types. We've also got a, um, um, we've uh, transfer learned AlexNet, which is a neural network that can classify scene types to uh, classify uh, scenes under, I don't know, man-made, nature, um, indoor scenes. Different, different scene types. Different scene types, types yeah. yeah. And then using the natural scene stats and other metrics, we can then say um, a certain scene type with this certain characteristic is best used. A better used. likelihood. Yes, yeah. and then we also, if, if we have the database and it's um, and, and we're going to use different quantities, random quantities of, of random images and quantities of that, that scene type to determine how many scenes are required and how the, what the error introduced when we're using less and less scenes. Right, thank you. So ideally, so think, we, ideally, we want one scene because if it's a live yeah, MTF. But as you have found, it's, it's, it's yes. very variable um, what we can very, get from yeah. a scene. And Depends on the scene type. Absolutely. Um, so, Susan, you have your hand up if you want to Yeah, it, your question. As, as you remind us what um, sort of the application for this is in terms of CCTV and uh, um, autonomous driving. vehicles, those are, are two areas where you might expect to find a lot of edges because in, in, if we look at your scenes, the the ones that work and the ones that don't, the ones that work have 
a lot of um, built up. objects in them, so buildings and such. So it seems um, for each of your applications, you might want to pick a set of images that's going to be representative of what that camera might see. Yes, so the once we have a framework established throughout from uh, edge isolation, which I've been discussing today, mm -hmm. to the estimation of the MTF, um, this can be tailored and best suited for the individual applications. Um, and also um, each application, so CCTV, automated driving, all have different um, ISPs associated with them, different resolutions um, and different frame rate rates. So uh, have you looked at those systems uh, no. or just the one camera so far? Just the one, ca uh, uh, three cameras so far. So we have two DSLRs and one um, smartphone. Okay. So essentially so the one, yeah, yeah. The DSLRs are, um, we treat as linear. There's no signal processing within them. And we're Minimum. using the raw files and using the, uh, using the, um, we're going to be using the, um, uh, the data before demosaicing. So it's, it's very as linear as possible. Um, and then we've got a very non-linear um, device, smartphone, um, as a comparison. Yes. Well, thank you, Oliver. Yes, Jeff, I think that you have your hand up again, and if yes, you want to um, put your mic on. Yeah, good. Um, I, I'm just trying to understand, uh, and forgive me if you um, said this at the beginning again, what the uh, application is. You were just sort of talking about that, but it seems that it would be for cases where you don't have the camera in hand, so you can't just put a test chart in front of it. Um, yes, and um, yeah, carry on, sorry. Well, f so for like a vehicle, you might ha have it look at a test chart when it's coming off the assembly line. And mm -hmm. so is the mm -hmm. idea that you want to monitor the kind of health of the system throughout its life if it gets. So yeah, that's one application. Um, also monitoring the actual atmosphere. So if it suddenly becomes foggy and you're in an automated vehicle, you probably want to take the wheel. Um, and fog will reduce the uh, performance and blur edges so um, as well as atmosphere um, and the ISP of these camera systems react specifically and can be tailored specifically for uh, uh, test charts whilst in we can then also use natural scenes to better understand how uh, any camera system reacts within the real world um, it also can be used as a tool to um, compare different uh, smartphones, different camera systems. So you can um, go through throughout the web, web, downloading photos for a specific camera system, and then evaluate how that is compared to another one, um, and how it and how the ISPs work. So there's, a, there's a, several applications for such. Method. So that last example, uh, it sounds like you don't trust manufacturer specifications. Uh, a lot of the time, um, they don't. Sh their methods to measure the MTF are vastly different. Some are through a uh, ideal computed computed system. Some through a lab based physical measure. Um, so this will help kind of like bring them to the same kind of. MTF level um, right. comparison, sorry, yeah. Um, and then there's systems like smartphones where the manufacturers don't uh, publish MTFs and, and the MTFs for test charts are for test charts. They, they don't always represent the natural scene, the natural scene performance um, due to these very nonlinear ISPs. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I think Alan at some point uh, raised his hand. Now he, I can't see him. Um, Alan, are you still there? I am. I am. Uh, I am. Still here, but actually, Susan got the same question to me beforehand. Uh, it's about the application of this for automotive, because uh, automotive uh, images you think are full of nice straight edges. Um, um, Alan, I think your 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 voice is breaking up very much. I don't know if your mic is if you if you don't mind repeating. 
because we heard half, half of what you said. My apologies. I think I'm sharing this live with Hillary. Um, yes. So, um, automotive images mm -hmm. contain lots of straight edges. Yes. Um, was my question, but Susan got in there before me. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. So it was it was specific applications and how whether Oliver is testing um, data sets from from specific applications such as automotive, uh, where roads, signs, etc., are, are helpful. Um, yeah. Okay. As soon as you drive into a forest, it becomes very different. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it would be for city for city yes, purposes. Yes. Um, all right. So I don't have more questions myself. I see Brian rising, raising his uh, hand now. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. So um, one of the things that I'm interested in is, um, at least on the side, is uh, deep fakes. And one of the things with deep fakes is, is they're all synthetically generated images. And as such, um, they have no real um, camera artifacts to speak of because they were never captured with a camera. Oh. Um, so what I was thinking of during your presentation is, is have you looked at um, mechanisms to actually reverse this whole process to have, say, a set of uh, camera parameters and then inject artifacts into a synthetic image that would make it appear to be captured uh, by a live camera, maybe down to a specific manufacturer or a model. Well, that's very interesting. And um, I haven't considered this, um, but it's something to consider. Sophie might know more about it, uh, but um, I, don't, I don't know, but, um, I, but, but I, uh, it's, it's of, of, of a particular research as such, and we haven't, we haven't conducted it in our labs. I know of a recent paper coming from Amazon and Oxford, but uh, they are looking, um, I can't remember the authors. I, I think it's a joint paper from, from Amazon and Oxford University. Um, Oliver, you have this paper where they are looking at deriving um, um, yeah, from natural scenes yeah. from the point spread function. Uh, but this is done through neural networks. So it, it's done by measuring MTFs, feeding it in networks and connecting them to scenes. So, um, and, and then, um, so in this case, um, it, it would be easily applicable um, what, what you are discussing in, in, with their method. Uh, but but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting um, idea. Interesting and slightly evil. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Well, it's possibly to confront evil, evil, um, or you know, uh, un, 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 how to say it? Um, um, well, uh, new uh, ways of of propagating information and news which are which are evil or, or non non ethical. Say. Um, yeah, it's it just concerns me because. Um, there are there are companies out there and, and state actors that are actively deploying deep fakes. And it's right now one of the ways that you can detect a deep fake is by by looking for camera artifacts and because they don't do um, high frequency information in their images very well. Mm. And it's a matter in a lot of instances of security, um, who gets there first. If the good guys get there first, you're more likely to have a countermeasure ready and deployable as opposed to the bad guys getting there first, at which point you're now on the receiving end of their disinformation campaign. Well, I mean, in, that, that would be a very interesting research, but it would require in some way reverse engineering of, of essentially the, a very large number of camera systems, seeing the common things, seeing the outliers, and then proving that what is taken by this particular um, or, or this particular scene, and it would be a, a, a stream of scenes, yeah, it's videos usually, mm -hmm. um, are not coming from a regular camera, but it would require, I guess, um, um, I mean, you could do it with modeling, 
yeah you could model you could model cameras and artifacts and processes and then mm -hmm. and then um um, instead of going and you know characterizing a, a hell of a lot of uh, <laughs> of cameras, you could you could model them. Um, but it's an interesting idea, um, and for for um, for possibly uh, identifying uh, fake uh, fake scenes or, or or scenes of fake in fake news. All right. Do we have more more um, input or more discussion or more questions? Okay, well, in this case, I, I would like to thank Oliver to start with for his presentation. And I would like mm -hmm. uh, those with, uh, who uh, participated in the discussion, uh, thanks very much for your input and the rest of you who uh, just came um, to uh, see the presentation. And I would like to remind you that we have another seminar in 15 days. I think it's the 29th of August. Uh, with more uh, student research that has been presented uh, at ISNT conferences. And I hope to see you all there. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sophie. Bye, everyone. Bye.